Okay, we'll wait a few more seconds and let a few more people roll on here and then we'll get started. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the February version of the Great Plains and Midwest Climate Outlook. Uh, we were talking about what song or theme music we should have. We could probably use American Pie February Made Me Shiver as, as our start here as we've got some gusty winds across the plains. I'd like to welcome you, um, and, and I'm your guest host this time. Uh, Doug Cluck is out of the office this week, uh, therefore I'm, I'm sitting in, and I'll, I'll turn it over here to our presenter this month, uh, Dr. Jim Angel, the state climatologist uh, at the University of Illinois and the Illinois State Water Survey. Uh, take it away, Jim. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the, the uh, Great Plains and Midwestern Climate Outlooks webinar, and I'm your, your tour guide today, and uh, we'll be talking about uh, all good things about what's going on in the Midwest and the High Plains uh, today, and this is a shot of the creek uh, just, uh, just down the street from my office here that uh, uh, kind of typifies the experience we've had here in Illinois where We've had plenty of rainfall, so the, the creek is actually above above its normal flow in the wintertime. Not much ice on it. It's still pretty running pretty clear, and just a little bit of snow, and, and by this afternoon, that's probably all going to be gone because it's starting to warm up again. So that's really kind of been the story of the winter for us in many places in the Midwest and in the High Plains is that it's been a fairly mild winter, and we'll look at uh, some of those maps here in just a minute. So getting moving forward, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we've got uh, <clears throat> some general information. Uh, this webinar is done in conjunction with a number of climate service providers across the central re region, including state climatologists like myself and Dennis and uh, National Weather Service folks as well, and the Midwestern and High Plains Regional Climate Centers, the National Drought Mitigation Centers, and others. Our next outlook, our webinar, will be on March 17th with Dennis. And these are always time to coincide with the release of the seasonal outlooks from the Climate Prediction Center. You can see all of these webinars and all the recordings of not only this one as we put this one on, uh, but all the previous ones if you go to the two uh, regional climate center websites here, the, either the, the uh, Midwestern or the High Plains Climate Center site and you can check those out. So if you want to go back and see slides again. And there will be time at the end of this one to field questions for our panel. So we're going to talk about current conditions. We're going to talk a little bit about impacts. It's not too many impacts out there right now. It's, it's kind of it's pretty average winter, so we're just kind of seeing average kind of impacts. So it's not nothing really exciting at this point. And then we'll look at the outlooks. But uh, first of all, the National, or the National Center for Environmental Information put out their report for January of this year. And if you look at the statewide average temperature rankings, really for a lot of states in the Midwest and the High Plains or the central region in general, uh, we've been averaged maybe a little bit on the above average side on, on temperatures. Uh, it sort of fits the classical El Nino pattern, pattern that we expected with warmer than average temperatures across the northern states and maybe not so much in the in uh, the, the central portion here and then colder than average in the southeastern U.S. So there's kind of that pattern showing up, but it's not real strong. If you look at just the January numbers, uh, many of the Midwestern states were close to average. It's the, the high plains and kind of the northern states that were a little on the warm side there. If you look at statewide precipitation rankings, we had many states in the central region that were actually below average on precipitation for the month. And in fact, if you look at over here, like Kentucky and, and Indiana and Ohio was the ninth driest uh, January on record. So that kind of that end was was a, a relatively dry. You go farther west, and you get out to Kansas, Nebraska, and Colorado, and they're a little wetter out there, a little closer to average for the month. Uh, but this falls on the heels of a very wet December through much of the Midwest, so 
this in itself is of no concern, no real alarm that we've got a dry January. In fact, it probably gave us some breathing room from all that flooding we had back in December. So this is the last 30 days. This is what's happened since the last webinar in the, the, the middle of uh, January. So if you look at the color coding here across the central region, areas that are in the kind of the, the yellowish and, and orangish colors there, that's uh, the precipitation is uh, less than an inch in many of those areas. And if you go farther uh, east, you see some of the, the start to turn a lot more green and a few blues as you get into Kentucky there. So we have a lot of areas in uh, in the High Plains region that are actually you know less than an inch, kind of a band of, of wetter conditions from basically Colorado through Nebraska, Iowa, and, and Wisconsin and Minnesota or Wisconsin and Michigan. And then we got another band in through Kentucky and then on the East Coast there. So we got some streaks of wet conditions. And most of that is from one or two winter storms that passed through the area, but most of the uh, region, it was fairly quiet in, in the last 30 days. Now, if you look at that as a departure from average, you know, you just don't get that much precipitation, especially in the upper Midwest and the high plains during, Jan during the last 30 days. It's just the averages are pretty low, and so even if you only get an inch, that's still close to average. So most of the region is actually at or above average, and you have to get down into Missouri, uh, southern Illinois, and, and across uh, Indiana and Ohio there to see any kind of dryness that has occurred in the last 30 days. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the, the picture on the, the precipitation side. So and again, precipitation is the not only the rainfall, but the water content of any snow as well. Now we kind of focus on uh, snowfall alone. Here we can see that pattern of some of the heavier snowfall amounts. There's that one storm that passed through Colorado and up through the, the central part of the central region and uh, from Colorado to basically Wisconsin, and that dropped quite a bit of snow. So that was probably our, our one big event back in early February. We had another uh, shot of, of snow, another uh, system that uh, rolled through, I think about the, uh, the second week of February that there right around thanks or Valentine's Day as a matter of fact and of course that went out on east and made a lot of history out there but for us we kind of got nicked by that one down in Kentucky and and southern Indiana and so forth so we had two big areas that had uh, sizable snowfall amounts that are in the green there five to fifteen inches and a few spots uh, like over in Colorado there that got up to twenty to thirty to forty inches of snow so uh, there was some action going on, but there's other places like Missouri that didn't get much snow at all, so it's relatively quiet in, in some other parts of the of the Midwest, including the Dakotas there. And here's yeah, and this is just to show the, the tracks of those two major storms that rolled through the region there that, that gave us uh, all that snowfall. So if you look at the snowfall departures, you know, we're for the most part we're not that far off from average on snowfall. The areas that did get the the winter storms got are a little bit above average on snowfall, and the areas that missed out on that are actually a little bit below average on snowfall. Uh, so it's it's kind of a mixed bag across the the, the central region, and uh, so that's the kind of the, the the story there. So it's really been fairly quiet, it went, except for those two storms. We really haven't gotten that much snowfall. So many areas are you would talk to people in in places like Michigan and so forth would be uh, kind of maybe disappointed with the lack of snowfall that we've seen in the last 30 days. Now we look at temperatures. We look at this as temperature departures across the central region. This large area in the the upper part of the, the, the region, kind of the, the northern states there, Montana, the Dakotas, and Wyoming, and, and Minnesota, and then on down through the high plains, they actually had well above average temperatures. So that's, uh, we in the forecast and in experience with past El Nino events, we kind of expected the northern states to see some of the largest departures from average on temperatures. And that's certainly the case here. Uh, but also in this case, it also extends down into the more into the plain states than what we've seen in some of the forecast 
and also some of the historical stuff. Now, if you go farther east, it's actually close to average on temperatures of the last 30 days. Uh, now, embedded in all of that is the fact that uh, many areas in the, especially in the Midwest, kind of seesawed back and forth. We had some very warm weeks and then some very cold weeks. And so they kind of ended up canceling each other out. As a result, we ended up being near average. But there's actually some pretty wide swings between very cold temperatures and very warm temperatures covered up by just that 30-day uh, average. But the main story is the fact that we've had some very uh, much above average temperatures in the, in the northern states and all the way up to the, the plains there. We look at the water content of the snowpack, which is actually probably more important than the actual snow death, but the water content in that snowpack you know, for the most part, it's uh, this is a little bit unusual to see this uh, not very much uh, water content in the snowpack across the the U.S. at this point in time. I mean, it is mid-February, so it's usually about when it's at its uh, greatest in most areas in the central region. Uh, we do see areas out in Colorado and Wyoming that that have a pretty uh, a fair amount of water in that in that snowpack, and we'll look at some of those areas more closely here in a minute. But if you look at in the Dakotas and the rest of the High Plains states, and all the way over to Missouri, there's really not much of any snow to speak of. And in fact, the stuff that we see on this map and on in Illinois right now is is on its way out the door, uh, really, as we speak here. So it's disappearing pretty fast. The only areas in in kind of the Midwest and the High Plains area that have much of a a snowpack with any amount of water content is this area up uh, to the north here, centered around Minnesota and Wisconsin, where we do have about one to two inches of water content there that's uh, waiting to melt out. And then we've got a second uh, maximum over here down in Kentucky and Ohio that's kind of the leftovers from that, some of that earlier snowfall. So we got this kind of strange case that we've got places in North Dakota with less snow than Kentucky. So that's kind of interesting situation to be in. And you know, one of the things we look at, or I've tried to look at in the past, uh, is, is try to address the issue of how severe or non-severe a particular winter is. And this is uh, an attempt by uh, two researchers here, uh, one here at Steve Hilberg and, and then uh, Barb Mays with the National Weather Service look to, trying to come up with what they call an accumulated winter season severity index. And the idea is they're trying to combine things like how much snow you got, how long it sat on the ground, how cold it was, how long that cold wet, cold air lasted, and try to put that all together into one index that kind of gives you an overall feel of how severe the winter was. So we've in this map of the United States here, we've got selected cities across the region, and many of them are definitely on the mild side across the, the U.S. Uh, the, in fact, the only places that are even uh, somewhat severe this winter have been out in Wyoming and Colorado and then Washington, D.C., <laughs> thanks to their big winter storm out there. So it looks at your departures from average on, on, on the temperatures and snowfall and takes that into consideration. So it's a way to kind of summarize how this winter has felt for many people across the, the central U.S. and the, the, probably the experience has been it's been a fairly mild to moderate winter. There really hasn't been that much snow, that much lingering cold. So it's, it's um, I think this pretty well characterizes most people's experience with this El Nino winter so far. Now we go back to soil moisture. We talked a little bit about the, the snowpack earlier. If you look at soil moisture, it's a little hard to get a good handle on soil moisture in the wintertime because a lot of times the ground is frozen. So if you get precipitation and it sits on top of the ground or runs off if it's if it's rain. Uh, and also if the soils are frozen, they might latch onto uh, soil moisture a little longer than they would in the summertime. So it's always a little tricky, uh, but we've got a couple of models out there that, that try to address this. And, and most of them are pretty much the same. They show some areas of dryness up in the Dakotas and up the Ohio River Valley. And then the rest of the region, it shows some degree of wetness here. So these uh, the shades in blue here are about one inch above average, one to two inches above average, and 
uh, the areas in the, with the orange and yellows there are about uh, one to two inches below average. So nothing, as far as the departures go, nothing too startling there. And I would say that if you look a little closer at some of the areas, uh, it may be a little more to the story than just uh, what we see with the soil moisture models. This is the soil temperatures. This happens to be the foreign soil temperature under grass across the, the central region. And this is based on a number of mesonets and the climate reference network sites. So we've got kind of a spattering across the, the whole region here. But uh, you can see that. Uh, this area they got circled in red here is are most of those soil temperatures of four inches are, are at or slightly above uh, the, the freezing mark and then the ones to the north they are actually uh, at or below freezing. But so it kind of got uh, uh, at least at four inches we've got some still have some frozen soils as you go northward but not so much in the south. And I see that's, that's probably been true for this whole winter season. I know in Illinois, we've just seesawed back and forth in of, out of frozen soil. So uh, it's not been consistent at all. And we've probably spent more time uh, unfrozen than we have been frozen. So what does that mean? Well, getting back to the, the soil moisture, what that means is in those areas in the southern half of the central region, uh, with so much uh, freezing and thawing going on, that it can actually allow some of that water that fell in December to percolate through the soils and drain out, especially in fields that have good uh, tile drainage. So you see here, this is just a, a quick look at the soil moisture in Illinois based on the NAS reports. And on December 31st, we had a fair amount. We had 57% uh, surplus in the topsoil and 40% surplus in the subsoil. A month later, it dropped down to 26% and 18% respectively. So a big shift from surplus to adequate. So that means basically it's going from saturated soils to soil to field capacity. So in the short term, that's actually good news because we really don't want all that water sitting on top of the ground. So we've managed to get rid of a fair amount of, of that and we're back to field capacity. So that's good news. Not only getting water out of the fields, but uh, probably give us a little chance of getting into the, the fields a little earlier this spring once things warm up. So a lot of that water that uh, fell across Missouri and Indi Illinois and Indiana back in December has probably worked its way out of the system by now. And you kind of see that. This is the stream flows. Uh, this is a, uh, I think this is about a 28-day average. Uh, I think that's what I pulled off the, the USGS site. And most of the sites, stream flow sites across the region are in green, and that's in the 25th to 75th percentile. So that's uh, in where you want to be in, in, in most situations. We've got a couple up in, in Iowa that are blue, so a little bit on the high side. And we've got a few uh, streams here and there that are in the 10th percentile, or 10 to 24th percentile range down in southern Illinois and parts of Indiana there. But uh, again, it's a little, little tricky this time of year because a lot of these streams, uh, some of the ones in Missouri and, and Illinois, like I said, are, are flowing, but uh, you get farther north and a lot of them are frozen. So it's a little hard to interpret some of these uh, numbers right now. And if you notice that you get up in the Nebraska and the Dakotas and Minnesota, we don't have any reports in those areas there. It's pretty well frozen in. So uh, at least based on what we see right now, most of the stream flows are in the in you know the average range or the kind of the, the normal range to maybe a little bit on the wet side. This is the um, map of the Great Lakes, kind of a com combination of both the water temperatures and the ice cover. So the colors indicate water temperature, and the, the the very and they're all in shades of blue right now. So they're all in the in the. Oh, probably about the, the 32, 34, 36 degree range. So that's about the color your skin would turn if you fell off the canoe in this kind of water. It's uh, pretty chilly there. And there is a, a little bit of ice. You can see, especially in, in the bays and along the shoreline there, that's those shades, various shades of, of gray. Uh, the amount is, it's actually been very slow coming on this year. I probably just started to get uh, some pretty good icing going in just the last couple of weeks, far less than what we've seen in the last couple, last two years. So right now it's about 23% ice cover. 
You notice that uh, Lake Erie there, even though it's the southernmost lake, is the one that's iced over the most. And that's because it's the most shallow of the of the Great Lakes there. So it's uh, it can cool off pretty quickly there and get ice formation there. So it's it's uh, so Green Bay is iced over a lot of those bays and a lot of the shoreline is iced over, and that's not a bad thing because uh, that's good uh, uh, protection against any past in a winter storm from a, a shoreline erosion. So those, that's uh, good to have. The bad news is with this little ice cover, we're getting a lot of evaporation off the lakes. So as a result, the lake levels have been coming down a little bit this winter. They're probably going to drop some more. They're still about an inch above uh, the long-term average for February, but they 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 were actually much higher than average uh, uh, about six months ago, so they're they're creeping back down to uh, close to average at this point. And they'll probably uh, continue to drop as we'll look at the forecast here in a minute. But uh, uh, they're just about average for for uh, compared to the long term at this point. This is the Missouri River Basin, the the water content of the snowpack above Fort Peck, which is up in uh, in Montana, and then they've got on the left-hand side, and then the right-hand side is between Fort Peck and Garrison. And so the the blue shading here is what's going on this year. So if we get the cursor going here, so this is the blue shading. So this is where we stand now in both of these graphs. Is the blue, the red line is the 1981 to 2010 average. So we're just a little bit under the the average for. Uh, the area above Fort Peck, and we're actually about an inch or two, about two inches below the long-term average between Fort Peck and, and Garrison. Um, and then they also have some other lines here, 2001, which I think is the lowest on record, and then uh, 1997, which was one of the highest on record. So it kind of gives you a spread of uh, range of how those kind of values spread. So they're at a little a below average at this point. Uh, but not as bad as what we saw, for example, back in 2001. This is the water content in the far west here. So for us, today we're looking at Colorado and Wyoming, and most of the basins there, especially in, in Colorado, look pretty good. They're about uh, close to uh, the, the long-term median there, and in many cases are in the green there, so that's good, 90 to 109 percent of average, sort of the median. So that's great news there. Maybe a few of the basins in Wyoming are a little on the dry side there, uh, about 75 to 80 percent of of the, the long-term median, but uh, the, some of the other basins are definitely in the green there. So snowpack uh, up in the the upper reaches of the Missouri River Basin look fairly good at this point. This is the U.S. Drought Monitor map. This is the, the, la the one that they just kicked out the door this morning, showing a little bit of drought conditions for the central region, uh, concerned about uh, some dryness in Wyoming and also North Dakota, probably the, the two areas in our area that show some areas that are at either abnormally dry or at least in uh, what they call moderate drought. So just uh, not too much. Most of it's in the far west there, but there are a few spots there and a few spots in Colorado and, and Kansas that are rated as abnormally dry too. But, you know, given the earlier maps of you know, the general wetter conditions we've seen this winter, we're, we're in pretty good shape in, in many parts of the, the central region. And uh, I uh, asked for some impacts this week, and we got a few responses. Really nothing, you know, there's no big negative impacts from this winter. I, I'd say, uh, you know, it's just kind of typical winter weather, so, you know, you're dealing with snow and ice and things like that. Uh, Fort Collins received their fourth largest two-day snowfall back on that February uh, first and second snowstorm, that's the one that went from Colorado to Wisconsin that drops all that snow. Uh, North Dakota, they've had a, a big, uh, noticeable lack of snow in the western uh, part of the state, and uh, but more snow in the east. And they've also had, uh, because of some recent snows in the Red River Valley, they're thinking that uh, increased the, the risk of flooding a little bit uh, uh, due to those recent snows. So that's... Uh, something they're watching up there. Iowa, ground frost is at its maximum for the season, and so they've got frost in the ground in most places. 
Uh, but they're starting to see the phenomena of where it starts to thaw out at the top. And I can tell you from first-hand experience, that's an unpleasant uh, uh, thing to deal with, with uh, either standing water or the top two inches turned to this really messy, really slimy mud. So uh, that's kind of where they're they're at now. So they're the so they had do have frozen soils, but they're starting to thaw. Minnesota streams and soil moisture is high. Frost depth is about average, and snowfall is above average in far southern Minnesota, probably from that one storm there, and then but uh, below average for the north and central part of the states. Now we'll kind of wrap things up here, looking at uh, the outlooks. And I just pulled this up a few minutes ago. This is the forecasted highs for today, and you can see. We've got some areas in Kansas that are up in the 80s already, so that, it's hard to believe in February that we're talking about 80 degree weather in the, in the high plains here, but uh, this, is, this is what's happening. So we've got a, uh, a low pressure system that's kind of skimming along the, the U.S.-Canadian border there, and that's uh, pulling warm uh, air up into the region. So the, this warm air is going to continue across the Midwest uh, into Friday and Saturday, so right now it's kind of confined to the areas uh, in the High Plains, but it will move into the Midwest there. So that's going to take a big chunk out of that snowfall uh, or snow accumulation that we've seen so far. And you notice right now, I bet if we overlaid the, uh, the temperature map with the snow cover map, you could see where, <laughs> where the, the edge of the snowfall uh, snowpack is because it's right along about the where that line is between the really warm temperatures and a little colder temperatures there are as well. So there's that's going to erode that difference here in, in short order. So this is the seven day forecast on precipitation. Really there's not much going on for us. There, like I said there's that low pressure system kind of skimming the U.S. Canadian border is going to bring a little bit of precipitation in the north there, but for the most part it's going to be fairly quiet. Uh, next seven days most of the, the precipitation is off to the east coast there, so a little bit of snow up in the Colorado and Wyoming area up in the, the mountains, but otherwise it's uh, pretty quiet for the next seven days on precipitation. Look at the six to ten day forecast. I always like looking at these because they give you a good idea what the trend is. Uh, so the 6 to 10 day temperature on the left hand side and the precipitation on the right hand side. So we see this very large area of uh, increased chance of above average temperatures uh, pretty much across the high plains and much of the Midwest there. And the dividing line is right through Missouri and Illinois and then to the east of that is an increased chance of being on the below normal side. So in that uh, 6 to 10 day period looks like warmer, weather, warmer than average uh, temperatures will prevail across much of the region, and also drier than average pretty much across the central U.S. Only the, the east coast is going to be on the wet side, or we're going to be on the dry side during this 6 to 10 day period. If you look at this 8 to 14 day forecast, it's kind of the same story. Uh, warmer temperatures to the west and cold to the east, and then uh, dry all around pretty much the entire Midwest, or, or really pretty much the whole U.S. is uh, uh, increased chance of being on the dry side in this 8 to 14 day forecast. Now we go on, and this, I'm just throwing this in there, this is an experimental week 3 and 4 forecast, and it looks like they update it about once a week. And so this is really looking out with your binoculars on uh, week 3 and 4, and it doesn't look radically different uh, than from uh, uh, the uh, 6 to 10 and 8 to 14 day forecast on temperatures was showing the warmer temperatures prevailing out to, to the west and to the high plains there and then colder temperatures along the Gulf Coast. In terms of uh, precipitation, maybe, well, maybe a little bit of Wyoming might be affected a little bit as, as well as on with below average precipitation and above average precipitation extending possibly into Kansas, but for the rest of the region it's pretty much EC, which is equal chances. So uh, this is kind of a, an El Nino-esque pattern over this uh, week three and four of warm to the north, cold to the south, and wet to the south, and, warm, and dry to the north. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, right now we have El Nino still, uh, but we're transitioning into uh, neutral conditions likely uh, in sometime later this spring or early summer. 
and with a slight possibility of a transition to La Nina conditions during the fall. So here's the sea surface temperature anomalies for, and this is about a week ago or so, and this is from uh, in, in degrees Celsius, so you about double that to get the, what the temperature departures from average are in Fahrenheit, but still a very large area of, of very warm conditions along the equator there. This is the El Nino forecast. This is uh, one way to look at, at it. Uh, this is the consensus forecast uh, from CPC and IRI. And the red bars indicate the chance of El Nino. So they have it in these three-month chunks, so January, February, March. And they've got it pretty much through March, April, May. is still having a pretty high probability. The probabilities drop off those to get into April, May, June, and May, June, July. Uh, by then, you're down to about a 50% chance of it being El Nino. And the green bars are the neutral conditions. So that's uh, our average, in a way to look at that. So the average conditions are creeping in there in the May, June, July time frame and, and kind of pretty much stay until June, July, and August, and July, August, and September, and on into fall there. They still have pretty good odds, maybe about a 50-50 shot of being neutral. There are there's some increasing odds of being on the La Nina side later on in the season. In fact, they kind of out, start to outweigh the, all the other categories as you get into that September, October, November time frame. But for the most part, it looks like we're coming off the El Nino and, and probably going to most likely slide into that uh, uh, neutral or average conditions. This is the plume forecast throwing all of the models, the statistical and dynamic models into the the fray together, and I, should, I meant to mark this, but you know, here's about the threshold here of, of El Nino. So they're showing it about that April, May, June time frame starting to drop back into the uh, neutral zone here, and pretty much staying that way through the summer months. And some of the models start showing La Nina when we get down into the, the later on there. But you know, even even later on in this through October and, and beyond here, there's still a fair number of models that are showing it as being neutral conditions. So uh, the, it looks like the odds of, of sliding into La Nina anytime soon are pretty slim. This is the March outlook. So the color scheme is like the, the other 6 to 10 day and then 8 to 14 day forecast. Areas in red are have an increased chance of being above average on temperatures during this time. So again, it's kind of a classic El Nino signature of, of the war northern states being warmer than average. And there's a little area of below average down in the Texas, uh, New Mexico area. But for us, an increased chance of above average temperatures across uh, the northern states and kind of the, the southern part of the central region is actually in the equal chances there. Uh, for the precipitation side for March, dry conditions out on the northwest and in the Great Lakes region. And then for the central region, the kind of the high plains have an increased chance of being on the wet side as we move into March here. So let's see how that plays out. And then here's the same story for March, April, May. So this is a three-month forecast. Looks pretty similar. The, the chances of warmer than normal conditions extends a little farther south. We now got Illinois and Indiana and, and Kentucky covered by that. So the, the odds have moved southward a little bit. As far as the precipitation, it's kind of the same as before. The Great Lakes region is an increased chance of below average temp precipitation. And the kind of the, the, the western part of the central region there is an increased chance of being on the wetter side. So, and everybody else is kind of caught in between there with equal chances there. So that's March, April, May. For June, July, August, we've got the, the whole United States is uh, on the increased chance of being on the warm side. So it's based mostly on the trends that they see. And then they've got equal chances pretty much across the whole U.S. Uh, for uh, precipitation. So this is a, a departure from what we saw in the last month or two with those seasonal forecasts. They were showing uh, especially in early summer, that some of that that risk of below average precipitation around the Great Lake Great Lakes would be lingering, and this one they've pretty much have taken that out. So, personally, I'm happy to see that that that's been taken out. But 
people still looking at to deal with warm temperatures this summer. Now, you know, one thing, just kind of a side, a side note here as we get close to the end here is that, you know, summertime temperatures, one of the things we've been seeing across the Midwest in recent decades is that the daytime high temperatures have not changed that much, and in some places they've actually cooled off a little bit. But what we have seen is the nighttime lows have been increasing dramatically over time. So when you look at this map of, of showing warmer temperatures, you know, we don't have to automatically assume that means we're going to see more really hot days. Uh, it could play out that we may see uh, warmer nighttime temperatures as well. So just kind of just a side thought side note there on how the summer temperatures could play out if they're consistent with the trends that we've seen the last couple decades. This is the September through November outlook and again they've got the whole U.S. with this increased chance of being above average temperatures and then they've got the southwest with an increased chance of being on the dry side that extends into Colorado and, and Kansas there. Uh, but for the rest of the central regions, it's equal chances through the, the fall there. Finally, we look at the drought outlook. Of course, there's nothing too exciting to look at because uh, most of the drought is, is far out west, so the, they show that uh, the dryness that we're seeing in, in Wyoming uh, is likely to ease up a little bit, but maybe the drought in the area, a little hot spot they've got in North Dakota may persist over the next uh, The central region is, is not only drought free, but there's not a, any signs of drought uh, 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 happening anytime soon. So that's uh, great to see that. So just to kind of summarize, oh, well, see, before I do that, just a, a reminder, as much to myself as anything, is that there are going to be uh, the flood, spring flood outlooks coming out today. They're later today, so I can't really talk about them because I haven't seen them. Uh, but I think you could probably guess that looking at the, the central region, there's probably not a huge risk for uh, major spring flooding right now. We don't have that much of a snowpack. There's about one or two inches up in Minnesota and Wisconsin and, and Iowa there. And even if that were to melt rapidly, that in itself would not be a problem. Probably the only thing would be is if we had uh, a major uh, uh, system move through that dropped a lot of rain on us like it did back in December. But Right now, I think probably could guess that most of the region is probably about average on, on spring uh, flood risk at this point. So in, in the last 30 days, temperatures have been above average across the upper Midwest and High Plains. Precipitation has been about average to above average across the region, except for Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. And again, that's no big concern at this point. It's probably a little bit of relief after all the wet weather in December. Snowfall has been below average except for the tracks of those two winter storms uh, that went through the region. And if we look at the forecast, uh, El Nino is still a player at this point and expected to fade out in, uh, in sometime in the spring or early summer, which is kind of typical of, of El Nino at, at this uh, historically. And we have an increased chance of above average temperatures over the next six months across the central region. In fact, it actually goes out to nine months. If you look at the fall forecast, and then an increased chance of below average precipitation for the next three months in the Great Lakes region. So with that, here's the information on our partners, and um, that we, a lot of the things we talked about today come from these sources, and this will all be in the recording and, and then on the slides there so you can look at that more closely. Uh, but I'll leave it here, and we've got, uh, actually I'll actually go one more slide here. So here's the, the, the last slide with some of our contact information here. And at that point, I, I will stop and thank you for your time and take any questions you might have. Thanks very much, Jim. Uh, nice job. Um, covered a lot of things in, in pretty short time frame. So, Chris, uh, can we go ahead and open up and, and allow for any questions that anybody has? 
Sure, rather than unmuting since we've got so many folks on the line, if, uh, if someone has a question that they'd like to ask, uh, there are no questions pending right now, but uh, if you'd like to ask a question for Jim or perhaps Dennis, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand and I'll unmute you from my end here and uh, then you can ask your question. Okay, I see we do have one question here. Let me get Sean Johnson, I'm going to unmute you here. Okay, Sean, you should be able to talk now. Go right ahead. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, great summary, Jim. Appreciate that. Um, the you. question we'll have is uh, looking actually, is there anybody on the call or can anyone speak to uh, fire season um, when we're talking about the, uh, some of the areas of drought that you addressed and also the uh, moisture conditions? Um, I'll, 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 Sean, I'll, I'll dive in on that for the little bit more maybe I, I know than Jim. Uh, you know, certainly the areas that are non-snow covered right now, uh, the fire season will be getting a bit of an early start because of the warm and dry conditions we're experiencing at this point. Uh, from an overall standpoint, uh, I, I don't, I, I've not looked at any of the long-term fire modeling to see what people are thinking about this year. At least from an early season standpoint, uh, the plains areas, at least the central Plains areas are projected to be somewhat wetter, according to the the outlooks. So there's pluses and minuses there. Obviously, um, you know the northern areas, the northern plains areas, which have been a little bit warmer and drier, not as much snowfall, may have a bit more of a risk at least early in the season. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, we do have a question, two questions here from Benjamin Diamond. Benjamin, I'm going to go ahead and uh, unmute this and let you uh, ask the questions directly or you should be free to talk. Okay, thanks. Um, first question is, do the precipitation departures um, include both rain and snow? Yes, they do. If you're talking about the, what, what we saw in the last 30 days or are you talking about the forecast for the future? Um, in the last 30 days. Yes, in the last 30 days those I, was, I showed uh, Precipitation departures and then the snowfall. So, yeah, the precipitation is the any rainfall in the water content of the snow. Okay, the water content in inches. Yeah. Okay, and then my other question was, um, why is the freeze-thaw cycle beneficial to the soil moisture? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, the, the idea behind that, at least what's happening in, in Illinois and other places, is when the, in, in a typical winter, and especially two winters ago, we had very uh, deep frost depth. And in those cases, it, the soil moisture pretty much gets locked in place for the entire winter. So if you get a big rain in, in November and then it turns cold, it, that's, that water is pretty much locked in place. This year, our soils were pretty un, much unfrozen most of the winter in kind of the southern half of the central region, so Kansas, Missouri, uh, Illinois, Indiana, and Kentucky there. So in those areas, if they're unfrozen, it allows that so, uh, that water to soak on through and actually drain out, especially in, in fields that have drain tiles in them, and do a pretty efficient job of getting some of that water off of the field. So uh, if you looked at uh, parts of Missouri, Illinois, in Indiana back at, at the end of December, it looked like the sixth Great Lake, uh, and now all that water is, is gone. There's no water staying on top of the ground, and, and the soil moisture, at least based on what little evidence we have, suggests that a lot of that's worked its way out of the system and out into the rivers and streams. So we've kind of moved that on out there. Okay, and um, last question was about um, El Nino. Um, tapering off. What are the signs that El Nino is weakening? No, that's a good question. So the basically they look at a couple of things, uh, including not only the sea surface temperatures, but they also look at things like uh, the the change in the trade winds down there, and also the how deep is the the, the layer of warm water underneath that. So they're trying to take into account all of that. And it's also there's this kind of seasonal cycle of these things die out in the spring anyway. So I think all of their indicators, uh, looking at the models and whatever else they look at, 
are indicating that it, it's uh, it's still here, but it's uh, in about the next uh, two to three months, it's going to start to fade away. To add on a little bit to what Jim was saying, he didn't have a graphic here, but there was some other, there's another graphic that came out yesterday via another conference call indicating that the, the sea surface temperatures were holding on a little bit more than expected that uh, into because some of the early February numbers were incorporated into some model runs, uh, therefore that you know might help El Nino hold on a, a little bit longer. It's not going to make a huge difference, but the 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 warm water was not dissipating quite as quickly as it was potentially projected to do. Okay, thanks. Okay, next uh, we've got Bryce Anderson with a couple of questions. Bryce, go ahead. You should be unmuted. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, hey, Jim, good to hear from you, and uh, great job today. Say, I wanted to uh, ask about the uh, soil moisture uh, model that you showed for the uh, for the region. Uh, it had uh, a pretty good amount of uh, moisture for the southern plains, and uh, we do see that uh, central Texas had quite a bit of uh, D0 show up in the drought monitor today. I know that's not quite in the region, but it's kind of getting close there. Uh, are you uh, concerned at all that uh, soil moisture is going to start uh, moving out uh, with uh, this uh, dry and windy and warm pattern that uh, you've got in that part of the region? Uh, you know, that's a good, a good question. I, I was probably more worried about that in the, the last couple of seasonal forecasts where they had the warm, dry conditions just going on and on. It's, it's Now that it's been... Uh, now that they've changed it a little bit, so we've got uh, the, the warmer temperatures are are still going to be there, but at least in terms of the precipitation departures uh, may not be quite as severe, or severe as in long term as it was. Yeah, it's you know it's really hard to get a handle, like I said, on soil moisture in the winter time. You know, you look at some of these soil moisture models, and you know, I'm not always 100 percent convinced that they're they're telling the true story, and, and in, in reality, I, I think we don't really know the true story of what soil moisture is doing in some of these places, uh, especially where we don't have networks going on. And I don't think I mentioned this in, in with our network here, but anytime the soils freeze, it really puts the uh, a twist on the numbers. So we, that's why we always take ours offline in the winter time. So you, there's fewer observations out there in the winter months. So it's a little hard to say how that, uh, what's really going on there with the soil moisture. Let me go back to the, um, you know, the other one I sometimes look at though is, is soil or the stream flows because they can also give you kind of hints about whether the, the overall hydrologic system is, is uh, running on the dry side. So we do see a little bit of dryness there out of the Texas and also out in parts of the can areas of Kansas as well. So there are a few dry spots here and there, but it's not really that well developed yet. So um, it's kind of sporadic there. So I don't, I haven't watched the drought monitor closely enough yet to see what's going on out in the with the Texas scenario of how that's unfolding down there. Okay. Um. I have another one having to do with the uh, icing on the Great Lakes, and uh, there was a. I've heard a couple comments uh, to the effect that uh, with with the uh, w with the icing, that uh, heavier heavier ice percentages uh, would actually maybe correlate to a better growing season over that part of the Midwest. Have you heard the same thing? You know, I haven't heard that one. I, I know that right now it's, uh, if, if we were to get a, like a cold air outbreak, it's uh, it'd be, it'd produce a lot more uh, lake effect snow at this point. But I haven't heard the, the correlation uh, or that strong one between the water temperatures and, and ice cover and, and the growing season. I suppose if you're right near the lakes, that can have some effect. Well, you've seen that in, I know, two years ago, we had the opposite concern of, of the, the lakes were frozen solid and they and they stayed cold very late, and that did kind of hold down the temperatures uh, right in the immediate area of the Great Lakes, but, you know, I'm not sure it had much impact uh, once you get more than, you know, 50 miles or so away from the lakes there. Okay, I have one more uh, question. This is uh, having to do with some news last week 
that uh, the Australia uh, Climate Office was going to uh, put in quite a few staff cuts. Um, are you, you are you uh, concerned about what that might do to the uh, climate information that we're getting out of the southern hemisphere? You know, as we go on here over the next uh, you know several years. Yeah, it is a good question. I, I've, I've heard the news stories. I don't have any inside information on how that's going to play out. I know there's concerns about uh, monitoring climate conditions down there, and, and those guys do a lot of research on, uh, on you know, what's happening in the southern hemisphere, and there's not many places that do that, and they've got some climate models they run down there for that. And, and they're actually there on the forefront of a lot of the El Nino and La Nina research because it has direct impacts on Australia. So it can't be a good thing, I would think, but I, I don't know the extent of, of how that's going to affect things to years for years to come. Okay, well, thanks, and it's uh, good to hear you again. Thank you. Okay, looks like we have one final question. Uh, this is from Digre Deauville. I apologize if I've mispronounced your name, but you're unmuted. You should be able to speak. Are you there? Okay, well, they had their hand raised. I've unmuted them. Uh, unfortunately, we're not hearing them. Uh, so I think at this point, that's all the questions that we've got, Jim. I uh, don't see anybody else pending waiting to ask a question. All right. Okay. Well, with that then, uh, thank you very much, Jim, and uh, thanks everybody for attending today. Uh, please join us again next month, the third Thursday of the month. I believe it is March 17th uh, when uh, I will be your presenter. Uh, we'll be talking more about the upcoming growing season and probably looking more at what's going to happen on the Missouri River. So thanks and have a good month. <laughs>